and welcome to worship at Plymouth Presbyterian Church. I'm happy to see you here this morning. I'm Erica Skemper. I am your substitute pastor while Jeff Foles is out on family leave. And we have happy news that Jeff and Kelly and Mari welcomed a baby on Wednesday. His name is Milo. Uh, more information will be, will be coming, including I hear word that there will be a picture involved in an email this week. So check your email for that. Um, I, will be, I will be in the office in person this day, we, this, this week, given no major crises with my children, um, Wednesday midday and Friday in the morning. And I'm also available on the office phone or by email. I believe contact information is in the bulletin. Uh, Gordon Dosher has a few announcements, um, updates about construction and uh, about the congregational meeting next week. Hi, I'm Gordon Dosher. Um, two things, uh, there is a congregational meeting next week uh, for two items, one is to uh, vote on consider an increase uh, in Jeff's uh, compensation. And uh, the second item is to consider a change to the bylaws uh, to allow a sitting member of session to be clerk of session. Um, and the other announcement is the parking lot uh, will be ground up on Thursday, this Thursday. Uh, next Sunday, you'll still be able to park in the parking lot because they're going to uh, take the ground asphalt and just uh, put it back on the parking lot. But uh, it'll look a lot different next week. Um, if they have completed the temporary parking lot down by the office, 
uh, they'll have also started to uh, tear up the two entrances to the parking lot. In that case, you're going to have to uh, drive up to Dunkirk Court out here and then come down and uh, come through the temporary parking lot into the parking lot. If they haven't done it, uh, then those two entrances will still be open and you'll be able to park as normal. Uh, still a little unclear about the timing on that, but, they, uh, but that is uh, uh, what's planned. So anyway, and there are lots of other things going on with the construction, but those are the th that's the thing that's most important probably to people here. Thanks. If you have any questions, uh, see me after the service or get a hold of me one way or the other. Thank you, Gordon. Um, before we begin worship, one thing I'm just realizing logistically is that for communion, will I be miked somehow down there? I can talk loud, but I know that that is not always completely sufficient for folks to hear. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll sort it out. Okay. Happy Pentecost Sunday to everyone. It is the, it is the Feast of Pentecost today. Many call this the birthday of the church. Um, I have seen churches before have birthday cake for this day. We, we don't have birthday cake, but I'd encourage you all to have a piece at some point today um, because it is, in fact, the birthday of the church. Let us quiet our hearts and minds as we prepare to go before God in worship. Please join me in the call to worship. The day of Pentecost is here. God's children have gathered in this place. God's spirit is transforming us. God's spirit is joining with ours. Come, spirit of acceptance, and open our hearts to all people. Come, spirit of peace, and calm our anxious hearts. Come, breath of God, and overturn our conventional lives. Let us join our voices and worship God with hymn number 287.
friends, on Pentecost, God poured out the Holy Spirit upon the gathered disciples, giving them bold tongues, open ears, and a renewed community. Confident that the Spirit is still present with us, let us open our hearts to God. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Loving God, we confess that we hold back the force of your Spirit among us. We do not listen for your word of grace, speak the good news of your love, or live as a people made one in Christ. Have mercy on us, O God. Transform our timid lives by the power of your spirit and fill us with a flaming desire to be your faithful people, doing your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Through Jesus Christ, God has poured out the Holy Spirit upon us for the forgiveness of sins. Friends, this is good news. Dear friends, as we have been reconciled to God, let us show the signs of that reconciliation to each other and greet each other with the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. Our scripture passage today is Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. You can find that on page 119 of the New Testament section of your pew Bibles. Listen for what God is saying to the church. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. This is the word of God. Will you please pray with me for the presence of the Spirit? O Spirit, move among us today like you did on that Pentecost. Open our ears that we may hear. 
and open our mouths that we might speak your truth in ways that everyone can understand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Does anyone come from a hometown or have another town that you love that is particularly famous for something? Like you drive into town and there's a big sign that says home of or birthplace of. Anybody? Raise your hand. No one comes from, yes. Grit. Judy Garland was born in Grand Rapids. I was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan, so I find Grand Rapids, Minnesota very confusing every time I hear it. I thought you were going to say Grand Rapids, Michigan, the fish ladder. Yes, it is. It's the, you're right. It's the furniture city. <laughs> other, other famous or things your hometown or your favorite town is known for. Yes. The Flower Festival in Lompoc, California. Yes. Yes, the biggest, there's a town in Illinois that's famous for just having as many of the biggest as they can. Like, they've just gone all in on the biggest thing. So they have places all over town with the biggest. Other, any others? Yeah. Spirit Lake, Iowa is some of the great places. Iowa Great Lakes. Spirit Lake, Iowa, home of the Iowa Great Lakes. There you go. Um, yeah. Uh-huh. Best town by a damn side. I lived for a while in <laughs> I lived for a while in Redwood City, California, whose motto was "Weather best by government test." <laughs> um, yeah, some for me. My my mom's side of my family is from Holland, Michigan, and they're famous for their tulip time. I grew up in Binghamton, New York, which is the carousel capital of the world. There are six antique carousels in town. They are all free to ride. So I thought it was normal as a small child to go to a park and have an antique carousel that you could just ride, and I feel a little put upon when someone pay, makes me pay to ride on one. Um, I went to college in Northfield, Minnesota, which is, anybody? Cows, colleges, and contentment. It's the motto of Northfield. And there are all of these, some are silly and some are beloved. Occasionally a town becomes famous or notorious for the wrong reasons, like an unfortunate event, an infamous inhabitant, or they just become a shorthand for a place that's highly suspect. Um, when I was in high school, my family moved from upstate New York to Berwyn, Illinois. Does anybody know Berwyn? No, I'm, yes, Berwyn. Some, so Berwyn has kind of a mixed reputation in the western suburbs of Chicago. It's a first ring suburb, and my siblings and I were coming from a tiny town in the country and my parents didn't want to throw us into the public school system there because it was kind of big and a little scary for what we were used to. So they sent us to a private school that was about 10 miles further into the Chicago suburbs. And my mom is a clinical therapist, and she worked in her practice was out in those suburbs as well. Um, and so we would have things happen like we had kids from our school who weren't allowed to come to sleepovers at our house. <laughs> because Berwyn had a dicey reputation in the, western, the far western suburbs. And one time my mom was um, working with a client and, and the client said something to the effect of, and then last week my lousy husband went on a bender and we couldn't find him until he called at 5 a.m. and I needed to pick him up in front of a bar in Berwyn of all places, I mean Berwyn. And my mom said she just had to sit there and like hold a straight face and not reveal that she too lived in Berwyn. Um, when I, when I lived in Chicago and was pastoring, I got to do some presbytery committee work with Jan Edmiston, who um, at the time was the assistant to our executive presbyter there. And she later became one of our PCUSA co-moderators. Um, Jan, by the way, keeps a really brilliant little blog where she posts these wonderful short little thoughts for churches. Um, but anyway, Jan, when I was working with her, used to recommend this thing to us where if our committee work took us to work with a congregation and we needed to learn a little bit more about the congregation, she would say, go early and walk around in the neighborhood around the church until you run into somebody on the street and ask them, hey, what do you know about that church on the corner over there? And what they tell you is going to be really revealing 
because what you'll learn is not what the congregation thinks it's about, but what the community thinks that church is all about. Sometimes the most damning response you would get is, I didn't know there was a church over there. (laughs) So it makes me wonder, what are we Christians notorious for in general, or more specifically as congregations, as individual congregations. Now in Acts 2, the story of Pentecost, it's a story that we read in church every year and that we're familiar with, and we often get fixated on some of the wild details like speaking in tongues and the flames of fire and and all these things. Um, But we often forget that there's this one little throwaway line uh, where people suggest that what's actually happening is that Jesus' followers are drunk, filled with new wine. And this is actually kind of a big deal because if you keep reading in the text, Peter delivers this sermon, which is lovely, and you should all put it on your list of later today when you're eating your church birthday cake. Sit down and open your Bible up again and read the rest of Acts chapter 2. It's a great sermon. But this, was ob- this insult about being drunk was obviously something that grated on Peter because it's what he opened the sermon with. He said, we are, we are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, and, and this was not the first time, you see, that Jesus' followers had been accused of something scandalous, of being drunkards. In fact, it comes up several times in Luke's Gospel Remember that Luke and Acts were almost certainly written by the same author, and Acts is really the sequel to Luke and connects back directly to the stories told in Luke. So there's several times in Luke where Jesus and the disciples are accused of being drunkards and gluttons, and it's said that they enjoy eating with sinners and prostitutes. And, you know, maybe this wasn't just empty slander. Maybe Jesus and the disciples really did have a lot of fun together, And maybe others sometimes looked at them and thought they were a little too joyful, and when they sat at the table with tax collectors and outcasts and women of ill repute, they perhaps should have been a bit more serious while they were around these folks. Side note is I personally love a good festive communion table. Um, I think sometimes we're too somber about it. We talk about coming to the joyful feast of the Lord, but then we all come and we're very, very serious. And I think sometimes we get stuck on the idea that remember me in the context of communion means that we're remembering sorrow, but I believe we're also remembering joy. I'm always a little suspicious of Christians who are too serious. Like, if your church picnic doesn't look like fun, I really don't want to go. Some of my best memories of growing up in church include the moments that were a lot of fun, like the time when a bunch of the younger elders in our congregation picked up this like serious dignified elder Um, he was a he was an English professor and well respected in the community and they picked him up and they went and threw him in a lake during a church picnic fully clothed and we know that he was he gave some form of consent because I remember distinctly as he was being carried down the hill he reached in his pocket and grabbed his wallet and yelled for his wife to come get it But this is not just about having a good time. The thing is, sometimes the things that are particularly Jesus-y are a little bit of a scandal to the world around us. And people are left amazed and astounded, like our text says, perplexed, confused by the church, maybe even a little bit scandalized by how we do things. Because if we are really living the way that Jesus taught us to, we should probably be sitting around the table with all of the wrong people. And that sort of behavior gets noticed by people who would prefer for everyone to maintain the status quo and would prefer that there's a sense of decorum about how we do things. Joy J. Moore is a Methodist preacher and last week she was speaking to a group of preachers about preparing for Pentecost sermons, and she said this, amazed and astonished. What amazes and astonishes people about the witness of the church today? It's not good, says Joy Moore. We're guilty of being hypocritical. We're guilty of being judgmental, arrogant, closed. In this text, what they are accused of, they're not guilty of. 
They're drunk, people say. No, no, they're not. We should not be hypocritical. We should not be judgmental, these things that seem to be what people are amazed and astonished of, about. But what we should be doing, or but what should we be doing that would make people amazed and astonished and that would bring glory to God? There's been some discussion in Christian circles lately about whether or not we should give up the name Christian. I have a friend who lives in a particularly conservative part of the country, and he's gotten so disgusted with the ways that people are using the title Christian that he's stopped using the term altogether. He's a seminary graduate, he's a former missionary, he's a committed and dedicated philanthropist, and it breaks my heart every time I see this, that this man who is living as such a good Christian refuses to use the name anymore And yet I understand where he's coming from, and I share some of the same concerns. But my thought is that maybe we don't abandon the name. Maybe we work really hard to be notorious as the church in all the right ways. Have you ever heard that joke about um, the devil, make sure the devil is worried when you get out of bed in the morning? I, I sometimes wonder what it would look like to be a church where people in the community say, oh, no. There come those Presbyterians again. What are they up to now? <laughs> I wish our churches were actively doing things and had, that we had the bravery to do the things that people might say that about us. If they're going to accuse us of something that is not nice or polite, if they're going to accuse us of something that is a little bit scandalous, maybe it could be what John Lewis, one of our great civil rights leaders, called good trouble. We should be getting up to good trouble. And I think of the good trouble that my friend Alan, uh, an Episcopal priest, generated in our town in California the year he tracked down seven used doors and he painted each one a different color of the rainbow and he put them out on the front of his church lawn with a big sign that said, God's doors are open. Over the summer, he had to repair or replace those doors over and over and over again. Alan's church was right across the street from our town's soccer fields and community park, and I figure that every little LGBTQ kid in that town knew by the end of the summer that those Christians over at the Episcopal Church would go out of their way to accept and affirm them, no matter who tried to tear down the doors. I think of the good trouble of another friend's church who hosted a ministry for opioid addicts. Their neighbors felt like it was too seedy, a bunch of people going in and out of that church, and they tried to sue them. They found out early in the lawsuit process, the neighbors, that they had no ground to stand on, and the suit was, the suit was dismissed. And today, that opioid ministry has actually grown to the point that the opioid ministry has its own building in the town and still works with the church. I think of churches that start handing out lunches to unhoused people in local parks and then the town gets worried and tries to shut them down and so the churches actually have to sue the town for infringing on their religious freedom, their right to feed the hungry. And maybe some of these things feel really big, but I'd like you to imagine, if you will, the followers of Jesus gathered at Pentecost and remember that this was a tiny community that wasn't sure what was next, that had just endured a really difficult couple of months, a really confusing couple of months, and they were wondering what was next. And as they gathered, not just for the festival of Pentecost, but in their regular time of being together, they were hit with the rush of wind and fire that was the Spirit. And just think about how notorious they became. So today, as we leave here singing, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Let's be moved and inspired by the Spirit to remember that God's love is not always nice, but often more than a little bit scandalous. And let us remember that we are empowered by the Spirit to go out into the world and to make some good trouble. Amen.
Will you please stand and join me in the affirmation of faith? We trust in God, the Holy Spirit. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all people to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, come, Lord Jesus. You may be seated. Friends, all that we have is a gift from God, and so as we give our offerings back to God, it is only an expression of returning what already belongs to God. Your offerings may be received in multiple ways, including methods online and the bird box in the back.
Excuse me. Yeah. There may be some people who uh, do not have communion cups and wafers. I'm going to, we have a way for them to get them. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay.
out into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Go out in the world strengthened and inspired to make some good trouble. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God and mother of us all, be with you now and always. Amen.